Ladies, gentlemen, and internet trolls, welcome back to Fan Fridays, the show where I give outsiders an inside look into the mind of an MLB all-star. What's the hardest sport to go pro in? I'll give you my thoughts right after the break. <laughs> Taking some questions from YouTube first. Question number one, what has been your favorite off-season trip you've taken? Any trips planned for this um, upcoming off-season? If so, where? I've taken some cool off-season trips. I loved Iceland. It was a little bit cold when we got there. I mean, by a little bit cold, it didn't get above 34 degrees Fahrenheit the entire time we were there. Um, that was in November. Uh, but I loved it. I wanted to go to Iceland for a long time. The landscape's there. The, it's just so different and interesting. So I, I really enjoyed that one. I loved going to Japan. I've been to Japan twice. I love the country. I love the culture. Uh, Tokyo is like one of the cleanest, coolest cities that I've... Probably the cleanest and coolest city I've ever been in. Uh, the people are super nice. The food's great. I, I love Japan's awesome. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Japan... I would highly recommend it. The country is just beautiful and in a lot of different ways. So that's one of them as well. Um, I've been to, let's see, uh, Costa Rica. I got some stuff stolen in Costa Rica, which kind of ruined that trip for me. Um, been to Mexico, Canada, been to Germany. I actually spoke at a, a coaches conference in Germany back in 2013, I think, early 2013, January. But uh, being half German myself, it was fun to it was fun to go over there and see some of the culture and see some of the I mean the remnants from World War II. Like there's still like uh, statues and sculptures that are that have missing parts of them that have been left that way because as a reminder of the war. So uh, talk to some people there who lived through the war who are just you know young children when that happened and you know for for someone who's half german and learning about the culture and and seeing some of that was uh was really eye-opening for me and it was a a good time so all of these ones i I like for different reasons i do enjoy traveling Uh, sometimes i feel guilty about traveling because i'm not working out and not trying to get better Uh, and that's really what i'm passionate about but those are some of the trips i've taken and it's hard to pick my favorite one but if i had to pick it would either be Japan or Iceland. So hopefully that answers your question. Question number two, what's your approach when facing hitters in spring training? Do you consider the hitters weaknesses or do you only try to execute your own game plan? I'm not trying to execute any game plan or really paying attention to who the hitter is in spring training for the first half of it. I'm trying to work on the things that I've been working that on that off season. So if I've been working on a two seam, I'm throwing all two seams to, to work on it or I'm pairing it with a pitch to figure out how I'm gonna use that pitch interaction during the season. If, it, if I've worked on command, I'm only worrying about command. If I've worked on velocity, I'm only worrying about velocity. That's usually for my first like two to three, maybe four outings. Sometimes you get six, sometimes you get seven, depending on how the thing falls, but usually I get about six spring training outings. So for the first three or four, I'll work on something that I've been working on that off season. And then the last two, I'm, just, I'm mainly worrying about reading the hitter's body language. Um, it doesn't make sense to look at scouting reports for spring training because it doesn't really matter and hitters are just brand new that year anyway. So they're not in the rhythm. They're not, you know, locked in yet. Um, uh, so no scouting reports, but I do try to get in the, in the groove of reading the hitters body language. Cause that's super important. Question number three, what's the biggest challenge mentally when trying to get a guy who seems to foul everything off? It's so annoying. I've matched up with the guys like Billy Hamilton enough that like he's just really good at fouling pitches off. And I feel like every time I face him, it's 10, 11, 12 pitches. And I'm just like, Billy, just hit the ball, man. Like I'm throwing you fastballs down the middle. Can you just, I would just get a hit. I don't even care if you get a hit. I know it's going to end up being a triple because you're fast as heck, but just put the ball in play. I'm tired of throwing pitches. Um, so, sometimes it's like that. And I'm just like, man, just put it in play. Other times it's like, I really want to get this guy out. Like, like really, really want it. And he keeps fouling pitches off. And it's like, man, how do you hit that? And then it's like a chess game. I had an at-bat like this with uh, with Joey Votto, actually, where he was like, I threw a really good pitch, and he like barely fouled it off. It was almost in the catcher's glove. And then I did another – I think I actually did a breaking point on this one. So if you want to see this at-bat that I'm referencing, check out the Joey Votto breaking point um, in the breaking point playlist on this channel. 
I broke it down. But sometimes it's like it's fun like that where you've got this this chess match going on. Um, so kind of kind of different. Um, you know, with guys like Billy or in a bat like that where I just wanted to put it in play, it's like, all right, I'm not throwing you anything else. I'm just going to throw you fastballs down the middle. Can you please hit it? With guys like Joey, it's like, okay, let me try this pitch. Okay, what does that do to him? What's his body language like? He didn't read that one very well. Let me try this one over here. And like, just constantly kind of bouncing back and forth on the mental side of it. So it changes, which is probably a good answer for the vast majority of questions. So sorry to go that direction, but hopefully I gave you some insight. All right, and now for some questions from my fans at trevorbauer.com. Scott Cragen says, how do some MLB teams pay the bills if they have poor attendance? This is a great question. Uh, maybe up to half of team revenue comes from fans in attendance. Um, that's including merch sales, uh, concession sales, parking, tickets, all that stuff. Some estimates for some teams have those you know, that percentage down in the 30% of total revenue, some, somewhere between that. But fans being there accounts for between 30 and 50% of the revenue, depending on the market and, and the team and how many fans they draw. So where does the rest of the money come from? Well, it comes from local TV deals. So this is why you see some games being blacked out because let's say Cincinnati will have a deal with the local, you know, TV provider. But that local TV provider wants people to go to their service, their app, their uh, cable network, like the whole thing in LA, if you guys don't know about that, is you know a, a cable network bought the rights and then you couldn't watch Dodger games on any other uh, service, MLB.tv, like the, the MLB Extra Innings package, you couldn't see it on nowhere, only on that cable package or if you had that cable provider's app. And so this is why blackouts happen, because of local TV deals. And the reason that local TV networks will pay so much for those rights is because then they can try to drive all the fans of that team to their, to their network and get customers. Uh, so that's one, one place that revenue comes from. But the main place that their revenue comes from is the national TV deals. National TV deals, TBS, Fox, ESPN, Network, I think those are the main three that have postseason games. So those are like really the three main players in the in the game national tv deals they'll pay mlb for rights to certain games and all that so there's this huge influx of money to mlb and then that money is distributed out to the teams in different ways uh, and so between local tv deals and national tv deals that accounts for the vast majority of overall team revenue so without fans they'll lose they'll, they'll lose some revenue but they're still making a lot of money on the, on the TV deals, uh, both local and national. Also postseason, they get a lot of money for postseason. Uh, the TV providers pay a lot more for postseason games and players get paid a lot less in the postseason, a lot, lot less. Uh, and so owners you know, book a lot of that, a lot of that profit um, from the TV deals and the TV money in the postseason. So hopefully that answers your question. Question number five comes from Connor Nichols, who says, what milestone balls have you kept for your personal collection? I have my thousandth strikeout. I have my first hit. Finally, I got it back after two years of it being missing. Teammates of mine stole it and lost it and then recovered it and got it back. So I have that one. Um, I don't know. I, I have a couple other ones. I think I might have my first complete game shutout, which happened to be on Father's Day, uh, which is kind of a cool moment. But yeah, those are, those are the ones that really stick out. I have some from college. Um, my debut, I got my debut ball uh, after I threw it to the wrong dugout. So I got a couple of them, a couple of really cool ones. Uh, let's see here. Question number six comes from Matthew Romstead, who says, if there was one rule you could add or get rid of in MLB, what would it be? Oh man, this is a good one. A rule that I could get rid of or add. Uh, does it have to be on-field rules? If it's an on-field rule, I think I would just make the DH universal. Um, no one wants to watch a hitter be bad at, or a pitcher be bad at hitting. I think I think it would speed the game up. Um, man, yeah, that that would probably be my on-field rule. I also don't like one thing that drives me nuts is when there's a replay and the manager steps out on the field and goes, "Hold on, hold on." 
And then he's looking at his replay review person. He's like, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Let's delay the game a little bit longer. Let's take 30 seconds or 40 seconds because we've got to call up and see if the guy's actually out or not. Hold on. Okay, 45 seconds later. Oh, we should challenge it? Okay, challenge it. And now the umpires go and look at the same footage for 45 seconds or a minute and a half or three minutes. And then they can't decide, and so the play doesn't get overturned. And now we're five minutes later in the game, and nothing's happened, and both sides are mad. I feel like that rule should just be you have 10 seconds. If you want to challenge it, you say challenge. If not, after 10 seconds, you lose your right to challenge. And then you would have to rely on your eyes uh, as a manager or a, a coach or something like that, or your player's intuition on the field being honest about, I was safe, or no, he was out, or whatever. Uh, but the whole delay tactic, hey, delay, 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 let's, let's look at it upstairs. Okay, now go challenge it. Like, eh, that's got to go. we got to clean that up. Um, no experience with the three batter minimum or, or anything else like that. Uh, I would change the cleat policy, uh, get rid of these like colors, this color scheme and 50% of the cleat has to be team colored this and then you get three alternate colors of that but you can't make any designs because that would be too cool and too entertaining and too many people would like that so definitely can't do that and on top of not being able to do it we're going to fine you if you do. Oh but you can't wear all black cleats because that's, we're going to fine you for that for some reason and then like, it, why does it matter? Like no one's looking at your feet. It's not, it's not affecting the game at all. I mean, I get it if you're writing like something really offensive on there to a lot of different people, but like if you're trying to wear cleats that honor your daughters or like cleats that connect with young fans, like what is the problem? Like let's get with the times. So I, I, I probably could rant a lot more about a lot of more rules that I'm now just thinking of, but the replay thing's gotta go. Uh, I'd make the DH universal and Figure out the cleat policy, please, MLB. I mean, it is darn near 2021, and we're still having this absurd discussion. Figure it out. Okay, moving on. Question number seven comes from Chris Garcia, who says, do you think baseball is the hardest sport to make it to the league? Why or why not? I don't know. I've never made it to the league in any other sport, but I'm going to give you a couple things to think about. One, how many players play professional baseball? versus how many players play professional football, basketball, hockey, golf, soccer, all, all the way down. And then how many spots are available in the big leagues? I mean, 26-man rosters, 30 teams, there's 780 spots available every year. Um, there's 30 teams by, is it 65 people in football? Is that the roster size? Uh, so there's more spots available to make it to the big leagues in, in, uh, or to the NFL in football. Uh, basketball, there's less spots, about 30 teams and about half the roster, 15, I believe, uh, in basketball. So just playing it that way, you would say that basketball is probably the hardest one to make it because there's the fewest players. Uh, another way to look at it is, you know, baseball, anybody, anybody can really play baseball, right? You, I mean, you can be 5'4", you can be 7 feet tall, you can be fat, you can be skinny. As long as you're skilled at what you do, there's a, there's a place for you. You can, you can make it. And we've seen that. We've seen guys like Stroman who are considered to be short versus guys who like Randy Johnson who are really tall. I mean, you got Jose Altuve standing next to Aaron Judge. They finished 1-2 in the MVP voting. So, I mean, all different shapes and sizes can make it. In the NBA, that's not necessarily true. Like, if you're not a certain height, it is extremely hard to make it. I mean, if you're not over six feet tall, like there's basically no room for you in the NBA. You have to be extremely talented at some skill. Maybe you're a three-point shooter. Uh, maybe you're really good as a, as a defender, uh, something like that. But the, it just limits the amount of the population that can make it there. Uh, the NFL, you have to be extremely talented and extremely physical. Um, so that limits the population in, in some way as well. Although, you know, building your body up is, there's a lot more people can do that and, and you can get bigger and stronger, but then you still have to have the skill of playing the sport. I mean, hockey is extremely, you know, taxing on your body, the endurance, like you have to be strong and physically fit and like have tremendous like coordination and, and all that. So those are just some of the things to think about. I guess if I had to pick 
one sport that's toughest to make it to the league, it'd probably be NBA just because of the height, you know, just how tall the players are. And if you don't have a wingspan and you aren't that tall, like your, your chances for success are really, really limited. Um, so that would be my, that would be my pick for toughest sport to make it pro in. And that's all of the questions from you guys, the fans. So I'm going to ask you a question of my own. And that question is, what's the best baseball story that you've heard? Best baseball story, clubhouse, little league, whatever, the best baseball story. Let me know in the comments below. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button because that would really help me out on my way to getting 100,000 subscribers by the end of 2020. And if you'd like a shout out in a future video, head on over to trevorbauer.com, sign up for my email list and submit your question on the homepage. That's all I got for you today. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.